What's up, WBB fans? I am James, and this is another episode of Inside the Cylinder, your home for everything women's basketball. Welcome back, yo! What's happening out there in WBB land? We are back with another episode. And today's a little different, folks. Normally, we'd start the day off with week three power rankings. We talk about what we just witnessed in the college basketball season. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about TCU, NC State. We're going to talk about big games coming up over Thanksgiving weekend. But we have to start today, of course, with the biggest news in the women's basketball landscape. Of course, I'm talking about the WNBA draft lottery results. The Dallas Wings are the huge winners of the Paige Becker sweepstakes. We're going to talk about what this means, not only for their franchise to land this type of player, but what other ripple effects that this might actually have next season going into the new CBA and so forth. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the Los Angeles Sparks. We're going to talk about what this means for them. There's a lot of chatter, a lot of speculation online. What are they going to do with their pick? I have a very specific take on this. And I'll be interested to see how many of you agree. So, as always, grab a soda, grab a chair. Let's get it popping. The Dallas Wings just won, as consequential, a WNBA draft lottery as the Indiana Fever won last year. I truly believe that. I know there's going to be some Caitlin Clark stands that say, that's ah, that's crazy. But what Paige will mean to her franchise, I think, will be every bit as valuable to Caitlin Clark. Now, that's not saying they're the same player. That's not saying Paige is better than Caitlin. What I am saying is this is a day one franchise-changing point guard. Not only does Paige score, not only does Paige facilitate, she leads, she defends, she play makes, and frankly, she just doesn't make mistakes particularly for someone with the ball in her hands as often as it is. When she gets to the next level, when she's playing with world-class players, her game is only going to be elevated. I absolutely anticipate her to be a day one impact player. She is as polished and fundamentally sound as any prospect I remember seeing. Now, don't conflate that with she's the best player that's ever existed. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying she is WNBA ready right now. She will average 15 points, 5 assists, 5 rebounds, a steal, and turn the ball over very seldomly. Not to mention the players on her team will dramatically improve from her presence on the court. And these are only the on-court benefits. I said on Twitter yesterday, a not-so-incidental ripple effect from this is now the price tag on Satu Sabali just went up. And the reason I believe this is, had they lost the draft lottery, fallen to two, they draft Kiki Iriefin, they probably just unload Satu to the highest bidder, And they start rebuilding through youth and assets. With Paige, the calculus changes, folks. Here's a couple reasons why. Number one, Dallas is now a playoff team. There is no doubt with the starting five of Paige Beckers, Arike, Maddie Segrist, Satu Sabali, Tierra McCowan, that is a 100% playoff starting five. And that's also not accounting for another 200K you're going to have to spend because Natasha Howard's out the door. So it's very possible other free agents might look at this Dallas situation on a one-year contract before the new CBA. Let me go pay with Paige and Arike and Satu and maybe bump up my value for a bag in 2026. So now Dallas holds a lot more leverage in this Satu Sabali sweepstakes. Like I said, I think it was very likely they were going to field offers and they were probably just going to cut their losses. They were going to take 
a first round draft pick, maybe two. And they'd say, okay, you know, thanks for the memories. We'll send you on your way. Now, they don't have to trade her for anything less than they think market value is. They are the ones setting the market now. And if people don't meet those needs, okay, we'll we'll core you. We'll play you this year. We can core you two times, remember? So we'll trade you. We'll offload you next offseason. But this year, you're going to play for us. You're going to put up great numbers because you're kind of playing in a contract year in a way. But you're also going to showcase how dynamic and fantastic our offense is with Paige Beckers leading the show. So in 2026, when we see a free agent class, the likes we have never seen before, a lot of players might turn their heads and say, hey, Dallas is looking pretty decent. Dallas's future is looking pretty good. Now, the caveat I will say is they have got to hire the right coach. Kurt Miller's running the show now as far as the general managing duties are concerned. They get a coach in there that players respect, players want to play for. Watch out. Like I said, I think this, I'm not saying it's definite, but this is a potentially franchise-changing moment. The ping-pong balls fell in such a way that this could absolutely change the trajectory of this franchise for the next 10 to 15 years. And of course, with Dallas winning the draft lottery, that means another team lost. And I, I really shudder at the term lost because I don't think that is the case, okay? And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But of course, the Los Angeles Sparks fall to two. They miss out on the generational point guard of Paige Beckers, which I do admit would have been an absolute perfect fit for the team. Obviously, they have their franchise center in Cam Brink there. They have their franchise forward in Rakia Jackson there. This would have been that, that third piece. But I do want to remind people, Los Angeles was in this very same spot last year. When they lost the draft lottery in 2024, they lost the ability to draft Caitlin Clark another generational point guard. I don't remember people being so sad for Los Angeles that they get to draft Cameron Brink. And now all I'm seeing is basically like Kiki Iriefin is not even a consolation prize. And I'm here to say she is by far, and I want to be very explicit with this, she is by far the second best prospect in this draft. If you want to make an argument that the French center, Dominique Malunga, has potentially a higher upside, okay, I'll listen to that. But who knows when she's going to be over? Who knows when she's going to be ready? Kiki Iriefin could play in the WNBA tomorrow. She will also be an instant impact. I see people online questioning, well, they need a point guard. Maybe we'll go for Olivia Miles. Now, I want to remind people, I put out my first mock draft on YouTube. I have Olivia Miles going third. It's not like I don't appreciate her game, her talents, what she could potentially bring to a team with some seasoning. And that said, there was never a scenario, no matter who won the draft lottery, where the first two picks were not Paige Beckers one, Kiki Irieff and two. No matter who won. Period. End of story. I think a lot of times, people get caught up in what a particular roster looks like today. They're not extrapolating forward five years, 10 years, so on and so forth. So Los Angeles needs a point guard. 
Well, you better just draft the best available. Well, that might be the case if Kiki and Olivia had the same ceilings and floors, and they absolutely do not. I'm telling you right now, Kiki Arieffin's floor is a 10-year starter in the WNBA. And I promise you, the other WNBA teams think this too. Olivia Miles, she has the potential to be a fabulous point guard in the league. There's also a scenario where she's not. And the way I look at these prospects is not only what do you give me tomorrow, what is the upside on investment? And the way I see it is Kiki Arieffin is so much better a prospect, I do not care that I'm not drafting for a positional need. That's how big a gap I see between these two players. Now, could Olivia Miles be an all-star? Sure. Could she be fantastic? Sure. I'm not saying that. I Like, again, I want to be reiterate. I have her third to Chicago. It's not like I think she's some kind of bum. What I'm saying is Kiki Arieffin, not only her floor, her ceiling. I, I told you her worst is a 10-year starter in this league. Her best is a perennial all-star. I do not find it inconceivable that she could step into the league tomorrow and average 15 and 10 and not break a sweat. Now, herein lies the issue with LA. They do have a lot of forwards. They have a lot of front court. I don't care. And I'll tell you why I don't care. Number one, D'Eric Hamby, and I like D'Eric Hamby. D'Eric Hamby impressed me a ton this year. Had much better production and improvement than I actually ever thought was possible. So big, big ups. She's got one year left on her contract. Okay. Next year, there'll be a new CBA. I should say after next year. So when her contract is up, guess what she's looking for? She's looking for a max deal, folks. And and I want to be as kind and as complimentary as I can. De'Erica Hamby is at absolute best the fourth best player on a championship team. And I know that sounds mean, but it's not. That's just the facts of the matter. So, and I'm not saying she doesn't, she shouldn't get that max bag. I'm not saying her production isn't crazy. I'm saying if she is going to be one of your two max contracts, you're not winning anything. You can take that to the bank. And I can't reiterate enough. I really, really like De'Erica Hamby. But instead, what I want is I want an upgraded version. I want a younger version. I want a four-year rookie deal version. And that's Kiki Arieffin. Folks, Kiki's offensive game is better than De'Erica Hamby's. And she's in college right now. And I'm not taking anything away. De'Erica Hamby, I cannot restate this enough. I would love to have her on my team. She does literally everything you'd want a player to do. But the fact of the matter is, Kiki, if she's not already, will be better than De'Erica Hamby. And, 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 you know, once again, feel free to write a comment, tell me how wrong I am. But that's how I envision this draft going. I envision L.A. drafting Kiki Arieffin. I envision them running out the clock on De'Erica Hamby's contract. First of all, L.A. is not winning anything next year regardless. 
So the idea that, oh, we need Olivia Miles to make the eight seed. Give me a break. Give me a break. Not happening. And even if it is happening, you're not winning anything. You're not moving the team along anyway. So once again, draft Kiki, run out the clock on Dierica. And then you have your three, four, and five for the next 10 years. You know what else you have? You have that 350 grand that you would have had to spend on Dierica Hamby. And now you have a free agent class, the likes we have never seen, with all kinds of guards ready to get paid. And there'll be plenty of guards looking for different destinations. I completely foresee a situation where we have a lot of big faces in new places. So that's where I see Los Angeles. And it might be a situation where I apparently am just far more bullish on Kiki Ariefin and what I think she's going to be at worst and at best than everybody else. But just like I said last year, LA, no one should be crying for LA that they got Cam Brink, right? They have their starting five, a perennial defensive player of the year candidate for the next 10 years. They have a potential scoring champ in Rikia Jackson for the next 10 years. And I think they're going to get an all-star four in Kiki Uriefen for the next 10 years. And then you go out, you spend, you develop, and then you're cooking. So like I said off the top, yeah, they didn't get Paige. Obviously, obviously that would have been huge. But just like Cam Brink, I think Kiki is going to be a mainstay in the purple and gold. Now that we got the big news out of the way, let's go ahead and do a quick little recap. Week three power rankings are in, and I think I'd have to check the files But I think this is the first time ever in three years of doing these things that there was absolutely not one single change. I don't think I've ever had a week where I've never had one single change. And that's not like even like a brag or anything because there was just nothing on last week. There was two ranked matchups. Uh, If you weren't here, let me give you the rundown. Number one, South Carolina Gamecocks, the juggernauts, of course. Two, the Southern Cal Fighting Jujus. Three, the Yukon Huskies. Four, Texas. Five, Notre Dame. Six, UCLA. Seven, LSU. Tigers. Eight, Boomer Sooner, Oklahoma. Nine, the Terrapins of Maryland. And number 10, the West Virginia Mountaineers. So the top 10 is the same. As far as the games we previewed last week, Quick little recap, the UConn Huskies take care of the North Carolina Tar Heels. Paige Becker showing why she should be the first pick overall. Four of eight from three, 29 points. Four boards, four assists, two steals, zero turnovers. By the way, Sarah Strong, absolute beast. 14, 13, six dimes, five blocks. By the way, 7 of 19 from the field, 0 of 7 for 3. Starts cashing in those threes. Watch out. Saturday, we had the Bluegrass Special. The Kentucky Wildcats end up defeating the Louisville Cardinals in overtime in what I would describe as a hideous game. No offense. Big win, no doubt. Big win, rivalry win. Uh, neither team scored more than 16 points in any quarter. Louisville managed just three points in overtime. There were a total of 43 turnovers in the game. Not pretty. Not pretty basketball. I guess you could say it was a defensive struggle. Uh, Looked like a football game. But uh, big win. The Wildcats, after uh, Monday, moved to to, uh, 5-0, as a matter of fact. So Kenny Brooks getting the old... uh, Getting the old Wildcats back to the winning ways. And in the final game we previewed, 
which was easily the best game of the week. The TCU Horn Frogs remain undefeated in a game we said watch out for. They beat the 13th ranked NC State Wolfpack. And also a little toot, 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 toot my own horn. Said Sedona Prince, probably going to have a pretty huge game. Well, I undersold that. 31 points, 16 boards, 14 to 24. Absolutely no answer for Sedona Prince. Also said last week, I know she's getting drafted. I don't know how high. Games like this, you know, she's going to move up some draft boards. Now, I think there are some fundamental things that don't necessarily translate. I don't know how much she can get up and down the floor. I don't know how quick she is uh, when you're dealing with the way the WNBA is moving. But you keep throwing up 31 and 16, guess what? It don't matter. <laughs> you're going to be on a roster. You can, you can guarantee that. At least going to be drafted. So, huge win. I do want to point out Isaiah James, number six on our big board. 27 points, 10 of 18, 5 of 11 from three. A bucket getter. I don't, I don't, I'm not loving um, NC State, to be honest. I think losing Baldwin is going to end up being a very, a very big piece. Um, Zoe Brooks looks great. Sanaya Rivers, good, good to very good, I would say. But it's going to be interesting to see how this team you know, get scoring outside of the big three because apart from them, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. Let's just put it that way. As for the slate this week, don't even worry about last week's slate or this week's slate up until Saturday because Saturday and Sunday folks make up for it. These two regular season games. I cannot remember two regular season games let alone in consecutive days, let alone in Los Angeles, where I reside, that have more anticipation, have more hoopla around. And of course, I'm talking about Notre Dame visiting the Galen Center on Saturday. You got pros up and down the entire rosters. Then Sunday, the champs, the 40 in a rows, come to Pauley Pavilion where I'm going to say this, folks. I think the win streak is in real jeopardy, folks. I'm not, I'm not calling it upset. I know that's pretty weak of me. <laughs> I should just go ahead and call it. I think. It's going to be a real game. I am not sure how Dawn's going to combat Lauren Betts down low. Not to say that South Carolina doesn't have just weapons after weapons after weapons. But I think she's going to eat. And I look for Janiah Barker to also have a really, really, really big statement game. So... I, honestly, I if you listen to this podcast, you know I'm a huge Juju fan. That's why I call them the Southern California Fighting Jujus. I don't know which game I'm more excited for. You know, we got Juju, who's the first overall pick. We got Kiki, who's going to be the second pick. We got some dynamic freshmen on USC. And then Notre Dame, we got Olivia Miles, could be a lottery pick. Hannah Hidalgo very likely will be a lottery pick. You got Citron. And then you got Leitu King, who I think is also going to get drafted off this Notre Dame team. A player to watch. Transfer from Pittsburgh. Super high motor, super high efficiency. Plays down low, doesn't really play outside the key. That's going to be a banger. Both games, absolute banger. So... No matter how poor I think this opening slate has been, those two games are absolutely must-see TV. Cannot wait. As always, thank you for the support. Like, share, and hey, hit that subscribe button. It's free.